بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وأن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار نعوذ بالله تبارك وتعالى من النار we begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the grantor of mercy, all praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Indeed, Allah is deserving of the best of thanks and the most beautiful of praises, those that we say and far above and beyond anything we can say about him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we testify that no one is worthy of our worship and our devotion but Allah alone, without any partners, the true supreme king, and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was indeed, in truth, his prophet and his servant and his messenger, whom Allah sent as a mercy to the worlds. And the truest of words, the words of Allah, and the best of guidance, the sunnah, the example of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the most dangerous of matters are the newly added matters into this religion. For every newly added matter into this complete and perfect way of life is a leading astray that only leads to the fire. May Allah protect us and you and our families and every sincere seeker from anything that could draw us closer to that fire. Allahumma ameen. Exactly one year ago, well, Gregorian at least, last year on December 31st, about this time, but Eastern Standard Time. It's nine o'clock now, so midnight. It was midnight in New York. I had to hand over the keys to my apartment. I was moving. And so I was kind of running uh, to beat the clock and emptying out my apartment and filling it in a truck. And I had the uh, dishonor <laughs> of riding through the streets of New York City as the clock hit 12. And people are just jumping for joy, going crazy, literally losing their minds, hugging and kissing and blowing horns and screaming across the street. And, and wallahi, I just looked around. I was at red lights. Every red light, I, just, I felt bad for people. Wallahi, I felt like how empty, how artificial is what, what do you have? What have you accomplished? You know, even the lunar calendar, something has changed. There's a new moon. What exactly has happened at New Year's? What happened? Have your debts been forgiven? The average American, I think, is like in $12,000 of credit card debt. <laughs> Are your problems solved? What happened at 12 o'clock? Absolutely nothing. And that's how empty people's lives are. They're looking for fulfillment in places that are nonsensical because they don't know where else to look. You know, there's a, a, a fancy term I'll throw at you right now. Uh, there's this joke that sometimes I say words that I don't fully understand myself just so I can sound more photosynthesis, you know? <laughs> Meaning more sophisticated. <laughs> The term is existential psychotherapy. You can, you can boast in front of your friends about that, okay? Basically what that is, it's a new form of therapy that addresses your psychology. Psychotherapy tries to shift the way you think. About what? Existential, regarding your existence. Basically it's a therapy that is based on a philosophy that the real reason why people are not comfortable in life, the inner conflict they have inside, why they can't find happiness, why they can't find inner peace is because they have a problem understanding their existence. They're, they have a conflict because they don't know what the givens, what the facts of existence are. And so that's why people don't even like to talk about like what's the purpose of life and these profound questions because I don't have any answers. And if I do think about it, I'm gonna have to think about death as well and I don't wanna think about that either. But the believer, by Allah's grace, Allah has pulled you out of that, rescued you from that. You receive your perceptions from the light of revelation, from the light of wahi. And so you know what are the givens of your existence, right? You don't just sit there and like live the moment. Whatever impulse you have, you just are compelled by it. You become a compulsive creature, right? Compelled by your impulse. I feel like this now, so I do this now. Allah pulled you out of that swamp, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because people have endless desires. You're born, you have a desire to suckle milk. Then you move on, at two years old, you have the desire to become possessive. That's why kids 
you know? <laughs> they say, mine, 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 mama, right? At two years old, why? It's just a natural desire. It's, they find it inside of them. You move on a little bit further, hormones start pumping. You have a desire for the opposite gender. You move on a little further, you feel like life is becoming lonely. You have a desire for companionship, right? And they just live being handed off from one desire to the next. By the way, this is very important regarding Tazkiyah. These desires are not haram, okay? These desires are not haram. These desires, physical desires you have, they're natural. Some people call them physical desires. Some call them the sensual, the carnal, uh, the animalistic, right? The fleshy desires have to do with your body, your physical, your flesh. That's not haram in and of itself to desire these things, okay? As a matter of fact, Allah Azza wa Jal, one of the wisdoms why He placed these inside of us is because they preserve our existence, right? Like if you didn't, if a baby didn't desire milk, it desired steak, the baby would die, right? If humans didn't desire the other gender, there would be no reproduction. The human race would end. But what Islam also turns our attention to is where do these desires come from? What do these desires represent? Okay? Because all of these desires you speak about, desire for food, for drink, for mating, for uh, companionship, these all come from where you came from. Where do you come from? Where do you come from? You have to bear with me. The dirt beneath your feet. And all of these desires stem from the dirt. Food and drink come from the dirt, don't they? Even your burger <laughs> was, is, is nourished by the grass, right? Your drink is from the water of this earth. Even when you desire gold and silver, according to one interpretation at least, scholars say because that was placed in the earth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? When you desire people, either sexually or companionship, whatever, that's because these people also come from the dirt. So Allah placed inside of you a natural desire to long for your place of origin to protect your existence. Does that make sense? It's important to understand this. But what Islam does for us, it takes us one step beyond that. You're not just a body. These are just the physical desires, right? What else are you? You're a ruh. You're a spirit. You're a soul. You know, Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, Allah said to the angels, I am creating a human being from salsal min hama masnoon, from clay that was made out of uh, hama mud that is masnoon. You guys know what masnoon means? Anybody? What does masnoon mean? Masnoon means rotten. Look at your food and your drink. The guy who slept for 100 years in the cave. It never rotted. So Allah is saying, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm creating a human being out of mud that stinks. That's rotten. That's spoiled. Even the translation has altered mud. That's not good enough. Altered meaning it went bad. It changed. You know what's happening here? Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, I am fully aware of what I made you out of. Why? Because the ignoramus, who's the ignoramus? Who's Mr. Know-it-all? Shaytan, he's going to come along now and say, You see this guy? You see this guy who you preferred over me? Like, have you taken a look at him? He stinks. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, I am not oblivious to what I made him out of. I'm fully aware of what he's made of. But the next ayah, Shaitan wasn't paying attention. The next ayah says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ But after I have fashioned him, that's how he's privileged. Number one, because Allah fashioned you with his own hands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hands befitting his majesty, beyond our imagination. But his hands, his two hands I fashioned him with, and then the second way Allah honored you, and I blew into him from my ruh, from my spirit, from my soul. My soul here means my, the soul that I've honored, by the way. We don't believe that a part of God is in us, do we? Do we believe that as Muslims? There's a part of God in every single one of us. No, no, that's not our belief. My soul, meaning the one I've privileged. The same way the Kaaba is Allah's house. It doesn't mean it's a part of Allah or Allah takes residence in that house. When Allah says, Naqatullah, the camel of Allah, 
an honored camel. Does that make sense? So when he says, my soul, this soul is created. It's not Allah. But I have honored a very special soul from me I blew into the body. Now prostrate to it. That's what you really are. Human beings are not a body and a soul. You're a soul that's temporarily living in a body. It's very important that we understand that. To understand how our, our lives, our souls get contaminated. You see, the people that don't believe in a soul to begin with, they're not even going to nourish it. But a Muslim believes that you are really a soul inside of a physical body. Because the soul was created first, and the soul is more important than the body, and the soul will live, on beyond, live beyond the body. Right? That's what you are. That's what makes you special. You're a spiritual being in a physical body. We care so much about this body, right? We'll get to that in a minute. Though it's but a vehicle. And so that's why, by the way, when the soul went into the mud, it got transformed. That's what made it special. And that's why when your soul gets pulled out of your body, you rot again. You become rotten. Right? Or wrong? That's why what you eat comes from the earth. And when you release it again, urine or feces or sweat, or it's, it has that stench. Right or wrong? But when the soul went into it, it became very, very, very special. And so the same way the body gets nourished by yearning for where it came from, the mud, the earth, the soul gets nourished by yearning from where it came from, from above, from the king above the heavens, subhanahu wa ta'ala, yearning to go upwards. And so when we live a life nowadays, all our life does, it serves the body, right? It's all about food and drink. How many flavors of coffee are there? How many flavors of barbecue sauce are there? How many different... Everything, what everything is objectified, women, sexual appeal, all of that. It's all about power. It's all about socializing and building friends and how many followers I'm going to have and how I can step on those that are like deterring from my prominence and like those that don't. Do when everything is serving that, the soul dies in this atmosphere because your body's nourishment is from its origin and your soul's nourishment is from its origin. So if you don't feed your soul, by connecting it with, with its origin, where it came from, it dies. You become an animalistic creature. The animal within becomes you. That's it. That's why what you take home, by the way. How much time do I have? 12 minutes. Okay, good. The four poisons that the scholars mention of the soul are not even haram in and of themselves, inherently. But the problem is an excess of them is what makes them poison. Too much eating and drinking, right? Too much sleeping, comforting, resting the body some more, right? Uh, too much speaking, socializing, and too much mixing, right? Secondhand smoke, also secondhand sins, destroy you just the same. Those four things, eating is not haram, sleeping is not haram. Speaking is not haram. Socializing is not haram. An excess of them will suffocate your soul, making them a poison. It's too much. You have, even in your physical body, you have elements in there that are fine. But if there's an imbalance, it destroys you. And so remember that. Now, that's how, those are the four poisons you quarantine from. You protect yourself from. And then you have to now foster the good elements. You have to feed that soul of yours. The greatest nourishment of that soul of yours is connecting with Allah. And the greatest agony of that soul of yours, that ruh of yours, is being distant from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, I created you to serve me, meaning that's what you're made for. Nothing else will satisfy you. The greatest, most satisfying thing in this dunya is knowing Allah. The same way the most satisfying thing in the hereafter is seeing Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the nourishment. That's your nutrients. That's your meal. So the same way you need food and drink and oxygen, you have even more of a need. You have a need. You have a need, a desperate need to learn how to love Allah, to learn how to fear Allah. You need that. To learn how to trust Him, to learn how to rely on Him, to learn how to enjoy His company. 
You know why we're miserable? It's because we dedicate our whole life learning on how to get an education, to learn how to get a job, to learn how to get a house, <laughs> learn how to get married, and that's it. If you live like that, then you're, you're living, you're not alive. You're living the life of an animal in the form of a body. But it gets worse. And I have 10 minutes to tell you how, right? Try to use six minutes and give you three solutions. And the last four. Yeah, right. Like, I'm going to be able to pull that up. If you don't pay attention and you live for these physical desires, these animalistic impulses inside you, you don't stay there. There's a pit beneath that. And these are the satanic desires, the satanic impulses. Look, you were came from mud, your, your, your longing is for the mud. Fine, physically. What did shaitan come from? Fire. So his desires are related to the fire. What are the two most necessary qualities of fire, the scholars say? Fire desires to go upwards, to climb, to be exalted. And it destroys anything in its way, on its way to the top. Right? You put a piece of paper over the fire, what's going to happen? Huh? It's going to burn the paper to get on top. It refuses to be beneath. <laughs> this is, these are the satanic desires now. If you're so bent on your sensual desires, you'll become addicted to them and you'll destroy anything in your way to get them. That's where envy comes from. That's where hostility comes from. That's where resentment and violence and hatred, that's where all that arrogance, that's where it all comes from. Interestingly, shaitan was bragging, I was made from fire, <laughs> right? And he didn't realize that he was supposed to be careful of the weakness in fire, the same way you have to be careful of the impulses of the mud. He bragged about that. I'm better than him. I'm made from fire. He's made from mud. And that's the very thing that destroyed him. Though, not that Allah destined him to be destroyed and he didn't have free will, but he wasn't paying attention. He let it take over. You know, some of the scholars say that if you pay attention to shaitan's I am better than him, you can pull out eight satanic impulses there and make a checklist for yourself or whoever wants to write. And I'll try to remember them. The first of them, obviously, is what? He's arrogant. Okay? Arrogance is what? To belittle others. But you can belittle others because you think you're a nobody, so you want to like step on everybody else. He was also conceited. He felt like he was better. Okay? That's conceit. That's a different disease. Some people are conceited, but they can keep their mouth shut. Some people are so full of themselves, they can't stop talking about it. Right? You all know that person. But be careful. It might be you. Right? They can't stop talking about themselves and their account. So that's called self-praise. The skit and That's another poison he had inside of him. Right? And also, obviously, he was envious. I'm better than him. Right? He was jealous of him, clearly. He's being defensive by saying that. Also, number five is that he rejected the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, what stopped you from prostrating when I commanded you? Right? I commanded you. Case closed. I'm not going to accept that command. Number six is that he accused Allah's wisdom. And you're never going to reject Allah's rules without accusing his wisdom. You think your decision is better than his. Or else why would you prefer yours over his? And that's something tons of people do nowadays, don't they? What do you mean cut off the hand in 2016? Are you, are you out of your mind? It's about to be 2017. Right? Do you realize what you're saying? They feel like they're going to one-up God on his logic, if that term is even permissible to use. But this is the type of statements that are being said nowadays, right? Number seven. Number seven is... Ah, uh, he used the false analogy. And that's not small. The scholars didn't say that. Like, he's just trying to fill a list. Of like how many bad things shaitan is ascribed, uh, subscribes to. Faulty analogy is the way that every ugly human being or jinn silences his conscience. I'm going to worship Jesus because Jesus had no dad. We all have dads. He's special. That's a faulty analogy, right? Because Adam said I had no mom or dad, right? I'm going to worship the cow because cow give me milk my whole life. Mom only gave me milk for two years. People say this stuff. It's a faulty analogy, but it's not about being right. It's just about, you know, silencing the conscience. You don't want to wake up in the morning and say, I'm a monster. No one likes to feel guilty. The eighth thing he did is that he over-rationalized. 
Allah didn't tell you why didn't you prostrate when you're better, when he's better, when you are better, or he is better. He said, because I said so. Why are you using your rationale when it doesn't belong? And so these are the types of mutations that come out of you not keeping your desires in check. Poisons and mutations, it gets that ugly. How much time do I have now? Five minutes. Oh, okay, so I have a minute to spare. Let me say a little bit more about satanic impulses. Just think about how much, like, how much evil, how many wars have ever existed, how many gangs, how many deaths, how much violence, how much hatred, how much divorce. You know, so many people out there, they're just so resentful. Like, this is not a natural impulse. Like, if, if I, some spouses hate each other so much that if I can't have it, you can't have it. Like, they just, they spite each other even when it doesn't benefit them. That's not normal. That's satanic. That's where it comes from. A shuh. You want to covet, and it's mine. That's what allows shaitan to take over. This is a, a shaitani personality trait, right? So some people, you wonder why they still continue in Ramadan, because they've become, an aspect of shaitan has become one with them. And thus we have made for every prophet, Allah says, shayateen, devils from the jinn and the humans. Shayateen from human beings. So now for the remedies. How do you... Climb out. We said the pits. Now how do you get out? Step one, you got to get rid of all of the satanic impulses. Seek and destroy. Figure out what they are. Study the subject. Take it seriously. Like Sheikh Jamal was saying. It's not a light matter. And get out. Like nothing left. Can we leave a little bit of arrogance left? Is that okay? The Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud in Sahih Muslim, nobody enters Jannah if there's the weight of a speck of arrogance in his heart. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we like to have nice clothes, nice shoes. Is that okay? Or is that arrogance? He said, no, no, no. Arrogance is the rejection of truth. You're not going to accept it because you're not the one that came up with it. You're not going to concede to a point because it came from another. The rejection of truth and the belittlement of people. And this is a genius, subhanAllah, a brilliant description by the Prophet Because the rejection of truth is something you do openly. Belittlement of people could be done inside. So just because you say, Jazakallah khairan for the advice... While deep down inside, you're saying, who the heck do you think you are telling me I'm wrong and you're right? That's still arrogance. It could be hidden. Check for it. The second thing you need to do now, you need to not remove the animal desires, the, the physical desires. You need to refine them. Whoever says you need to remove them has no idea what they're talking about. That's not Islam. It's Eastern philosophies and all that stuff. Like life is suffering and the more you hurt yourself, the better you'll be, <laughs> the, the more you'll transcend in spiritual. This is all bogus. And that's why it always backfires, like the Atkins diet. You know the Atkins diet? When you go really hard, you come back and you pray qada on all the carbs, right? Like you do extra. If you become really religious overnight and you stamp, you, you know, you floor it, the Prophet says no one does that except that the deen will overwhelm him. So the dunya, you're not supposed to remove it. You're supposed to refine it. So I really like comfort and sleep. Pray Fajr. I really love money. Just start, pay your zakah, right? Refine it. How do you refine it? By feeding the spiritual. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا Thus we have revealed to you a ruh. So you come from mud, you yearn for mud. You also come from a ruh. Allah sent to you a ruh. His revelation, He called it a ruh. He called it a spirit. Why? Because it gives life to your life. It gives life to your spirit. He says, we have revealed this ruh to you, this book to you, to feed your ruh. So the, the knowledge that we have sent to you will give you life. And also actions being coupled with that knowledge is absolutely necessary. You know, when, uh, when Abdullah al-Mubarak, and I'll close with, the, with these two narrations, he used to say, مساكين أهل الدنيا خرجوا منها ولم يذوقوا لذيذ العيش فيها these poor pathetic addicts of this world, they spent their whole life, they left this life without tasting the sweetest thing in it. They said, what is that? قَالَ مَعْرِفَةُ الله, Getting to know Allah. That's the sweetest thing here. That's not just facts. There are non-Muslims that study Islam and know more facts about Islam than you. They don't taste this. They're miserable. They can't go to sleep at night without their alcohol. And they wake up in the middle of the night because of their insecurities. And the suicide rates, I already read them to you last night. Through the roof and the opioids and wasting yourself. 
on all of this. Getting to know Allah is not facts. It must start there, but that's not it. Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, rahimahullah, I'll close with this. They said to him, Bima tunalu ma'rifatullah. How can someone get to that point where he, he really knows Allah? He's, he feels it. He's acquainted with Allah on a real level. Qala bi ta'atihi. He said, by obeying him. They said to him, Wabima tunalu ta'atuhu. How can a person get himself to the point? Which you're all thinking now. How can I get myself to the point that I'm really going to start obeying him? Really dedicate myself to his servitude? How do I get to obeying him? Qala bihi. He said, through him. It can only happen through him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, in the of Zayd ibn Arqam in Sahih Muslim, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, zakiha anta khayru man zakaha, anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. Memorize that and let it be the start. But don't stop there. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. O oh Allah, grant my soul its purity. Zakiha, its piety. Zakiha anta khayru man zakaha. And purify it. You're the best one to purify it. Anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. You are its master and you are its guardian. We ask Allah, the master and guardian of our souls and our lives to not allow us to die except when he is pleased with us mm -hmm. and not allow us to leave this world before tasting the sweetest thing in it and make the best of our days the day that we meet him subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. oh Allah master and guardian of our souls grant our souls its taqwa its piety and purify it you are the best of those that do so and I pray that Allah forgives us and you and grants us and you sincerity and pulls us out of this conference better than we came into it Allahumma ameen, ameen. Zakallah khayrin everybody